lot of friendly faces in the audience, a lot of my friends, uh, a lot of hugs this morning, so it's good to be up here. Uh, appreciate it. My, uh, my journey in this industry started in 1996 when um, Getty Images acquired the company that I was working for called The Image Bank. And back then they bought The Image Bank because we were using a software called FileMaker Pro. Well, they bought it for lots of reasons, but they were using something called FileMaker Pro to index and discover content um, in our archives, the transparency archives. And what we didn't realize then, I don't think, as kids was Getty Images was buying the first sort of search system that they were going to bring online in, in, in the late 90s. And that afforded us to bear witness to lots of changes. And in 97, after they acquired uh, Weststock and Photodesk, you know, stock agencies started using websites for the very first time. And if you think about it, we were the first industry to sort of do e-commerce on, on the internet in those early days. And that, that in and of itself was quite an amazing transition. The, those early websites were fostered and developed by companies like 2020 Software, uh, who I chose to use uh, when I launched my own agency in 2001. But you know, as the years progressed, we had uh, quite a bit of change happen throughout the years. Of course, the, high, the heydays, I think, of our industry, 2003 and five afforded the prolification of royalty-free photography, and uh, we tra traversed from CD-ROMs to online digital assets, and more and more consumption was, was, uh, was happening. Aggregator models started developing. In 2001, I, I created a company called Media Bakery, which was an aggregator by definitions, and we had partnerships with, with, uh, with Getty Images and Corbis. Um, but something was, always, something was always happening that I sort of observed when I landed at Rick Ridgway's Adventure Photo and Film, where we tried to innovate on a model that afforded our buyers who were asking us for content that was obscure or hard to get to go out and produce it. And so I scratched my head on it. That was something that, as a young kid, piqued my interest, and I was really interested in trying to come up with a scalable model for that. And I'd bear witness to some of these models taking off and then quickly dying off. But it, to get a creator to go out and shoot a custom photo on a, or a film clip on an on-demand basis was something that was just wasn't, wasn't picking up. The price in which the creator had to, to charge the buyer was too great. But um, some things started to happen throughout the years. Um, you know, one of the biggest things that happened is 2008, the industry almost collapsed, right? So we all suffered a lot of pain shortly after that. Um, but, you know, digital, the digital era was picking up at the same time, and we started to understand that the market was changing and digital channels started exploding. Ad agencies were educating their customers that if they don't talk in digital speak, they would soon, soon uh, possibly attrition and, and die off. What we ended up learning quickly is that what was once four content pieces a month was now 4,000 content pieces a month for these brands. And the reason that we exist today as custom content producers is because of this this trend line where ad agencies themselves are contracting and more and more uh, of their customers are bringing in that content production in-house. And that's because of the prolification of social media channels. All these social media channels are forcing enterprises to take control of the ROI. And that return is a super important. It's an expensive return that they have to manage, but the content production associated with it, you can't do in the agency. So it's too cost prohibitive. So what do these guys actually have to do but to look at either using stock photography or using a small roster of photographers and creators to produce that content themselves? Well, that becomes very unscalable very quickly if you have to do so much digital speak. And so what happens is those agencies start to contract. They start to lose a little bit more business. Enterprises take on that responsibility. And we look at the market size as being roughly split in two. You got $4 billion for the stock photography industry, but you had this other $6 billion in custom content creation, which does include agency work and some custom content production through production companies and digital agencies. But it costs, the problem is, is that it costs another three times the amount of effort and endeavor to produce that $6 billion. So you're looking at kind of a $24 billion problem when you add it up, and that is a very big problem for enterprises. Problem is visual content is at an all-time high. 
uh, it costs a lot more to produce that content than it does to source the content alone. And another thing that's happened is our you know, consumers' visual cortexes have been trained. I mean, we all kind of know that already. The, the buzzword of authenticity has been certainly overused over the years, but it truly is something that consumers recognize content when it looks real, it looks like it's in the feed, they will interact with it, they'll transact on it, they'll, they'll transact 30% more when, it's, when it seems to be more authentic. And custom content sort of bypasses stage production work. It's built and created from a different thesis, but it drives a better con conversion. And so if you're a brand in a, in a business and you have to tell a custom or localized story, you have to either hire an, an, an ad agency, you've got to hire a creator to go do it, but there really isn't a great way for anybody to do this. It's a fragmented process. You have to navigate a sea of freelancers to basically land on somebody who's going to produce custom content for you. And so what you're seeing is you have a lot of companies using custom content platforms in most recent days and years. Actually, it's a relatively new industry or a, a, an industry that has been reborn, I would say. And these companies sort of break down uh, custom content as a service. And so you have you know, three main service lines. You have locations, you have products, and branded libraries. So locations are, are here's an example of a location. A company like DoorDash will use a company like Snapwire, Miro, perhaps even Snapper, these are some of the competitors which I'll go through, to go source visual content on location because their job is to make sure that when consumers go and open their apps to consume food, that they see a visual representation of the entrees that are actually on the, on the app. That's an example of how a custom content model is working at scale. Another example is when a travel agency or a travel booking company will come to us and, and use us to produce travel guides. This is where it's important for them to tell a localized story, and in order to do so, that the content needs to be on brand and, um, and at scale. They have to do lots and lots of locations in one particular city. Products is fast-moving consumer goods. You know, this is anything from uh, bottles of tea to bottles of soft, soft drinks, et cetera. You kind of get the, the, the sense of fast-moving consumer goods. Those products need to be told in a lifestyle setting. And then branded libraries are, are, uh, are, are needs that are more or less the enterprise itself, the brand itself, wants to see that content in that brand in the imagery itself. So important for the brand identity, the color scheme, uh, to be produced in the library. So we do these custom library builds in our space. But all this is happening because of a couple of things. We, in 2005, you know, the first affordable DSLR camera was born. So that accelerated um, the, 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 the birth of the ubiquitousness of, of photography and photographers around the world. Uh, Facebook started to recognize that the social platform could start to monetize. Instagram became uh, a popular destination for uh, monetization of ads. Um, we had, you know, a birth of Snapwire in 2012, which then we launched in 2015, between 14 and 15. And all these digital channels started to occur for the brand. And finally, they started to recognize that they actually had to be speaking in the digital speak. So we began to see the unlocking of two things. Creators coming to the marketplace, needing and wanting to understand how to monetize based on the visual assets that they could create. Suddenly, aspiring photographers felt like pros. They could actually become pros. Um, that afforded brands and enterprises to be able to harness that particular opportunity and, and give them a way forward to produce visual content. But all these platforms basically do something very similar. It, we use technology as a software to, as the foundation, but it's an old school process. You know, it starts with the creative brief. Um, it goes in three main stages. The brand or the enterprise approves that creative brief. The creators are assigned. Some platforms do it automatically. Uh, some hand pick them. And then the content is basically created off platform. Can't do anything about uh, having the, the platform itself produce the content. And then it's curated with a managed service. And then, of course, the content can be downloaded for use. Some content pl platforms uh, offer a royalty-free license. Others offer the purchase of the copyright. 
Um, it depends on the particular model uh, that the enterprise or the brand is needing. But effectively, the content is ready to use and is typically owned. Sometimes when we deliver content in our industry, we actually insert Im imagery, or, excuse me, keywords and, and important data into the IPTC header of the imagery, which provides added value. These platforms will want to pick up the assets immediately after they're produced and start to instantly display them in their, in their products, their mobile apps, their websites. It's at a great efficiency and speed, so it removes a lot of the friction and or team or full-time equivalents to actually upload that content to the, to the end product. Uh, you know, what we charge for locations versus product and, the, and or library is different. Um, locations can be relatively affordable on a, on a per location basis because the cost associated with producing a location um, and the creative requirements at those locations are, are, are limited. Uh, they're, they, aren't, they do not require lots of models. Uh, there isn't a lot of high production value there. So we end up seeing that locations can be in the sub thousand, possibly a couple of hundred dollars per location, all the way up to uh, $500 per location. Uh, locations typically are, the location needs are typically geo-centered or geo-ranged. Geo so what we mean by that is that, you know, we'll enter into a particular city or a, a market and produce lots and lots of visual content. As an example, here at Snap, or I'm, you know, at SnapArt, my platform, we produce almost 14,000 briefs in a month. Uh, the life cycle of a brief is pretty straightforward. It's just like you would see in any other creative process, but typically we do a creative call with the client, and we log that, that need into the platform. That creative brief is then launched out, um, and then we uh, seek to get the client approval on that creative brief before it's launched out, excuse me, and then when it's launched out, we employ a strategy. Typically, depending on the content need, it might take a couple of photographers to get the content produced, um, or it actually might be just one individual photographer. Uh, we'll go ahead and set the payout for the creator, uh, making sure that the get a bed money is just right for them to be able to source that content. And then the logistics and the shoots go off underway. Um, we confirm who the photographer actually is, and then they go out and produce that content. It's QA'd. We do touch-ups and then it's delivered. Every content platform goes through this life cycle. Some use software to actually facilitate this and make it go a little faster. But really, it's, it is still a service-based business. You still have to go ahead and have manual people run through this process. This slide is a little bit out of order from the previous one, but custom libraries is the other side of the business that we do. This is where a brand or a business comes to us and they want to have their brand identity inserted into the imagery itself. The price per, per brief on these uh, custom libraries uh, can be in the thousands of dollars. This is where we're producing 25, 50, 60 assets or more for a particular library and having those assets uh, look on brand and uh, available for, for with, the, with the copyright as well. So people ask, you know, who's in the space? And they'd like to know, like, where do we fit into the ecosystem? This is the way that I look at the market today. Um, we have, you know, producers who produce very high quality. We have those that focus on you know, fast-moving consumer goods and brands. And we have others that are sort of focused more on affordability and scale. And perhaps even consumers fall into that lower bucket. But the way that I look at the market is that you know, we've strategically tried to have our foothold into three specific areas. We have a network of 750,000 creators in 180 countries, which affords us to be anywhere to go shoot custom content. And not to put my agenda first here, but others do the same as well. Miro and Snapper, they have large networks. I would say Snapper is probably the largest footprint. Miro has about 50,000 creators, and Snapper has somewhere, I think, around 30,000. These individuals, including Codekit, have used technology, quite, they leverage it quite heavily to actually produce the scalability, um, prob, you know, solve the scalability problem. When enterprises have a need for scaled content, you invariably need to have a technology platform in order to facilitate those shoots. Snapper is a relatively new company. Miro, as you all know, probably recently raised around $250 million at a really high valuation to sort of attack this problem at scale. I think they're going to go into consumer. I think they'll actually do small business quite heavily. 
Uh, we're focused on the enterprise along with Shutterstock and SmartShoot. Um, we're focused on those brands, um, but we also do do these scaled uh, photo shoots when required. You know, the industry, it, the custom industry sort of competes with the WPPs of the world, right? So we're out to, you know, I wouldn't say we're competing with the WPPs, although we end up inherently do compete with them, but we do find that uh, what we, we do find that when we go to them, they often look at Snapwire and other platforms like Snapwire and the custom model as you know, possible distributors. So it's interesting to see how agencies view these custom content platforms. And of course, I had to put the ribbon on Snapwire, but this is a, a, a comparison chart as to who does scale versus quality and also serves consumers. So no, none of these in, in this particular roundhouse serve the consumers. <clears throat> and consumers, I would say, is a good starting point for some, um, but for these particular groupings of companies, they all started with the enterprise first. And why, you know, what the advantages of these platforms provide is that they, you know, have a repeatable and scalable process. They unify the brand team against uh, sh producing one centralized guideline into the platform, and artists are able to create uh, basically at their own schedule. Um, it's very sexy right now to be talking about custom. At the end of the day, it'll be interesting to see how it shakes out. Uh, assets that are produced on custom platforms tend to be exclusive to the buyer, and um, a lot of the, the platforms to date produce content that actually affords tagging to be, again, inserted into the IPTC header or just to be associated with the assets themselves. So I wanted to open up any questions about the custom content model. I realize that this presentation was a little bit out of order and it kind of threw me off, but. Um, I'm sure many of you that did decide to learn a little bit about custom have some specific questions about the Snapwire platform or perhaps some of the other competitors. And so if you have a question, please raise your hand and, and ask me. It's possible. I think what you're tapping into is UGC content, right? User-generated user content isn't curated and it can't be created on, with a sort of style guide or a creative guideline, right? Um, you can only harvest and pick out and cherry pick the ones and then try to consolidate them into a, a cohesive set of work. Individually, or excuse me, UGC is individually produced by individual creators, and so when you're trying to build a body of content, you're going to need technology or a lot of curators to bring that to make that look like a cohesive story arc that the brand or the business wants to be able to tell. Um, there is a spot for lower payouts for creators, but I'd like to talk about this get out of bed money, essentially, that a creator is willing to go to receive in order to actually get out of bed to go do it. And it tends, up, it tends to be quite high, excuse me, um, when you consider the, the, uh, the time associated with producing that kind of content. So a lot of these platforms have to sort of think in either hours or day rates, right? So a photographer's day rate can be as little as you know, $250 for a quarter day, 500 for a half, and maybe 1,000 for a full. And so your rate card has to sort of map to the effort associated with that work. So hopefully that answers a little bit, but I do think that there's a space for it, but it has to be sort of uh, based on the scope of work uh, being provided to the creator. Um, so there, just one is a clarification question, and that is there used to be a company that did on-demand photography, and it, I don't think, succeeded in part because the photographers were taking the risk. You're not doing that, right? You all are getting the projects and then assigning the photographers? That's right. Okay. Yeah, we're a network market. At Snapwire, we're a network marketplace, which means that we find utility in each and every one of the creators, but they're not doing any sort of crowdsourced or uh, pro forma or spec work. Mm -hmm. We provide the opportunity to somebody when there's a larger scope of work behind that need, and so we transfer that need to the creator at that time. And so am I correct if I say the benefit to the users and to the photographers is that you're sort of taking away the need for the user to hunt for the photographers? Is that yeah, right? there's a lot of value. It's really the value chain, I think, has to do with managed service, right? So we're a managed service that, and most of these companies are, that take off the burden of a, of a company to having to spin up a photography department to do scalable content. And that starts with the production or the articulation of the creative need, which a lot of these enterprises have a hard time facilitating or being able to do is to articulate what that creative need is. 
all the way through the actual production and finding the creators on a Rolodex, essentially, was what these platforms are. We're, we're a Rolodex, we allow you to discover the content, and then we go and have those creators produce that content, come back to the platform, and then we curate. So all those services that we provide afford us a different kind of experience, affords the, the buyer a different kind of experience. And then the, the last is the question of sort of how the, um, how the network works in the sense if I'm a photographer, I can sign up on your site, am I paying to sign up or is that? No, nope. anybody in this room can sign up to be an aspiring SnapWire photographer. Okay. Then you're effectively held in purgatory until you actually prove yourself. So the way that you prove yourself is you have to participate in photo contests and those photo contests actually build a library, a stock photo library that we have on the backside, and um, we discover you. If you're good, we'll nominate your photos, and if you are nominated, you'll start to earn points. And the more points that you earn on Snapwire, the more levels you'll traverse, and eventually you'll get to one of these higher levels, an advanced, we call them advanced uh, elite and pros. You can then be eligible to be assigned to produce a one-to-one -one shoot with one of the brands or the opportunities. Okay, and then the last part, the other side of that, so how do the agencies do they sign up? Do they, how do you, how does the agencies, or the, the people that you're trying to do the, the uh, projects for, how do you get them or how do they sign up? Yeah, so, you know, uh, Snapwire is in this unique phase, I'd say, where we had started in 2012 was an open platform. You were able to launch a brief, put a credit card down and, and, and ask for a content need. It was a lot like image brief, right, where we found that that was an unsuccessful model because people would support uh, you know, but the amount of effort required to produce a photo was greater than what people were willing to pay. So we ended up, you know, closing down that opportunity, and now we qualify each and every uh, brand, business, or agency that comes to the platform, or we'll go out and hunt for them, basically. But it is a sales effort. So in order to gain business and traction, you're asking, how do we get those business? We, it's an awareness issue. So the, you know, as people start to have. A realize, uh, sorry, as enterprises start to understand that they are burdened with producing all that visual content, they start to seek out solutions in the marketplace. So it's a little bit of everything, just like it is in the old days, about just making sure that you develop customers and go let them know that your service exists. Uh, as you tend to accept uh, almost everyone. Uh, uh, no, from again, anybody can sign up yeah. and play the game but you're sort of held in this area until you prove yourself. Yeah, but yourself. if I'm good uh, or if you're good, you would be able to come through all the process, I guess. Yes, you start to traverse. Yeah. yeah. Do it's you think, the, mod do you you think the model uh, will evolve in for the uh, uberization of the uh, assignment photography? So, say that say it again. One more for time. the uberization of the assignment photography and uh, soon will create the price pressure on that? Yeah, I'm just missing that first part you're saying. Uh, do you think the model will evolve into the further uberization of the uh, space and uh, will create price pressure on the assignment photography? Oh, I see. Um, I don't think so. I think price pressure comes when... So when you're a service, right, yeah. you, you sort of are isolated from pricing pressures because you're paying for a service, right? So as much as these platforms want to say that they're technology-based and technology-focused, we're really services. And so price is protected around that because there's a value exchange that can be articulated to the buyer. Yeah, but at the same time, uh, there is Snapwire, there is Miro, uh, and uh, honestly, tens of others. Of course, yeah. Yeah, and uh, ultimately, all of you uh, will soon fight for the same customers. And all of you will have oversupply from the photographer's side. So. Uh, Almost the same scene we have in the stock photography. Yes, I think maybe what you're asking or what you're stating is is that somebody has to make a choice about which provider to choose, and that's true. But if you chase people to the bottom in this particular model, you you won't sustain. There is this get a bed money. You're going to have there won't be any margin left over because you're going to have to pay creators to go produce the content, right? So unless you unless we we can't you know it's not a stock. Stock photography is a commodity product, right? Yeah. So you can price it any way you want, and we have all these advantages to doing that. In a service-based model, you have a, such a heavy cost of good, you're going to maintain a pricing structure no matter mm -hmm. who you're going to compete with, and the one who wins is the one that can provide the best service. Okay, and probably the last question. Now, why don't you consider the consumer market? It's just, you know, it, it's nothing that I'm not going to look at. I think it, it, there's a customer acquisition cost can, in volume, in aggregate, can be a lot higher to get the attention of customers or consumers versus enterprises. Mm -hmm. 
So when you look at trying to gain new net new business, grabbing these logos and giving them the explanation of the value proposition is, is, a, is actually can be an easier task than to try to announce to 50,000 consumers that you have this new service to do. It's a choice. You know, I think people do the long tail first, which usually takes a lot more capital to go and get that done versus going up at the high end of the market first. It was our choice to go to the high end of the market first. Hi, um, me, Kyle from Wirestock. We're a community of a uh, thousand plus photographers from around the world. And I was just curious if it's possible to sign up uh, on Snapwire as a, a group or a uh, community as opposed to a, uh, like a individual person or freelancer. Um, each and every creator has their own user account. So technically speaking, I suppose, yes, you could batch in, you know, we see some of our brands onboarding their own roster of photographers to work with them on the platform because we facilitate a lot of things, the license, the payments, et cetera. Uh, but the answer is yes, yeah, you could. Okay. Hi, Chad, I'm Chris from Getty. A um, couple of questions, actually. First one was, uh, I was very impressed by the 14,000 briefs per month you talked about, and just interested how that breaks down across those three verticals of location, product, yeah, and... Oh, sorry. Uh, you know, product yeah. and... Um, uh, and, and the, the, the brand library stuff that you're doing. And then equally, post-delivery, um, what happens to all of that long tail of content that's being created? Uh, we have a couple of models. So the, the first part of your, the, the answer to the first part of your question is, you know, the line share is location-based visual content needs, right? So, you know, delivery economies are exploding right now, and a lot of them are looking to fill their apps with lots of visual content. So you can do some quick math to figure out who those companies are within our ecosystem and most ecosystems, but they're real estate based, they're, you know, they're food based or they're platform services based. Um, so that's that answer. And then the models in which we sort of offer our customers is one of two things. You can either license the rights to the content, it will provide you a minimum guarantee of so many assets produced on a library shoot, um, or you'll get uh, the copyright. And if you choose to get the copyright, it's a sweep. You get everything, and then you get to choose which ones. We still will edit out the ones that are sort of off-brand, but you have the rights and access to everything. But the ones they don't choose, um, what do you do with those? They just return to photographer? In the copyright buyout, they go to them. And in the licensing model, we retain those rights, and they go into our stock photo library. How do you differ? I, I think there was a service called um, Image Brief or something like that. How do you compare to that? <clears throat> Image Brief um, was a crowd, well, it's sort of, it's a, um, a spec offering, meaning a creator or photographer would go shoot without the guarantee of payment, right? So you'd have a crowdsourced sort of model where creators would then submit to a, a somebody's specific need, elephant balancing itself on a beach ball, for example. Everybody would participate. One lucky winner would get the, you know, the awarded license, and it wasn't always guaranteed. So in our model, we, we guarantee the work for the creator. We actually won't contact you unless we know that we have a, a, a paying brief behind us. Makes and uh, the other question is the Google Images. How do you sort of uh, in get indexed? I mean, is there any sort of uh, indexing going on, SEO, and you know, how people? For our content? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, our platform is built to be optimized for SEO, and so we, we wrap all the assets around. We, sometimes the content is private, it can't be seen by the public because it's a copyright purchase, for example. Um, but yes, we, we do put the tags on and ensure that the SEO schemas are correct. Thank you. I'm interested in learning a little bit about your stock photo library side. What type of business model is that, and what kind of numbers are you seeing and growing by? You know, it's not a main focus for, for us at the stage. That, you know, we're kind of the late start startup. <laughs> so right now our main value proposition is custom, and so we focus on that. The library grows at a pretty you know, rapid clip, about 60,000 images a month. And, you know, it, it might blow you away, but 500 people a day sign up for Snapbar to do this like, opportunity, and we get a lot of visual content, and our algorithms sort of separate the wheat from the shaft, and we were able to see which great content was qualified, could be qualified for the library side. We sell that on a subscription model and on an a la carte model as well. 
um, early days, we kind of experimented on giving it out to image partners, but we pulled back from that strategy. So the numbers are really, really low there, only because we don't really uh, sell it, do, do any sell through on it at the moment. But our consumer, our photographer users are very interested in playing, playing that game. Um, I'm just wondering, could you give a couple specific examples of what the location-driven content is like? Is it, you know, facades of restaurants? Is it food and, you know, food in a restaurant? Is it general sort of illustrative pictures of Venice, you know, Venice Beach and the, you know, lifestyle there? What, what kind of content is if that? The intent think? comes from, a, you know, a platform, right? So mm -hmm. let's call it DoorDash. It's, we're probably one of DoorDash's largest vendors to creative co or for custom content. You know, that example is shooting menu items at a particular location, shooting the entire menu or a subset of the menu that it, whatever the restaurant partner has chosen to sign up to go do in the DoorDash onboarding process. And we'll go through a style guide and make sure that every single dish is uniform and consistent amongst you know, 50,000 locations. So like that's a, a great example of a location-based visual content need. On the flip of it, WeWork engages us to go shoot conference rooms so that when they when you go to the WeWork app, you're able to see visual location or visual representation of the conference room. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes, they paid their bill. So. I'm just curious, how many photographers reach that elite and pro level, and how many of them actually are getting paid that get out of bed money on a fairly regular basis, approximately? Yeah, I can't necessarily share exactly how many are actually getting paid. I think it's a little bit proprietary, but of the you know of the 750,000 creators, about half we call active, meaning they've gone through the flow of uploading photos to their profile and perhaps subsequently gone into a photo contest, and then within that subset, there's about 250,000 that I would say are have leveled up in some significant way, so we identify them as p potential capable people. A capable people means that, you know, somebody who goes and shoots a DoorDash menu photo shoot is very different than somebody who does a Royal Bank of Canada photo shoot. So, you know, these levels are critical for us to see within our community who has talent and who, who is able and capable to do one kind of shoot versus another, versus another, yeah. Created by you and DoorDash, maybe um, these uh, 500 locations or the 50,000 locations. Each of those counts as one of the 14,000 briefs. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. But you're talking about a sister-child relationship between briefs. I think at the end of the day, and yes, that does exist in our space. And there'll be a master brief, and then we'll have to go ahead and create that and scale that out. And that's where the technology sort of comes into play: is that you prolificate one style guide amongst many different locations using many different creators in those locations. Uh, Chad, what, um, what percentage of your assignments are video and what percent are still photography? You know, it's about 10% video, it's, uh, but it's growing pretty rapidly. Most of the brand library builds have an interest in doing video as well. Um, and are the contributors ever allowed to keep the rights to what they shoot or is it generally retained by the uh, producer? We sell it in one of two ways, and some, a lot of platforms do this, is we either sell a royalty-free license to the content, and of which the, the ownership of rights is retained with the creator, or we sell a copyright buyout. And in the case of the copyright buyout, the creator relinquishes rights. That's a more expensive license, I yeah, assume. There, and yeah. what's the percentage dividing between the clients that use that and <clears throat> then have a By royalty By total aggregate of volume of briefs on our platform, um, the majority of it is copyright buyout. And that's because the majority of the briefs are location-based, which where content of, or ownership of content is important to the platform that is securing it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't done that. I don't know. Yeah, it's probably in the guessing sub two hundred per, but above a hundred ish. So my, it's my empirical guess. I guess. Any more questions? I have one more. Um, how this is a technology Yeah, I mean, you'd be surprised that it's it's a. Uh, it's technology enabled, right? But it's not, um, we're not some magic 
poof thing. You know, we, we have salespeople. It's important to have salespeople in our model. Um, we have to penetrate and drive awareness. Um, so yeah, it's very, very sales driven. Uh, again, going to that same example, you have a choice of either, as a brand, you come to the platform or enterprise, you can choose to own the copyright or you can choose to license. And in the case of a copyright ownership, the brand owns the asset and the creator um, owns the, the, the asset when it's a royalty free license. Um, you know, it, it, that comes to a variable. It's, it's depending on the gross margins that we want to try to maintain. We try to maintain, on average, a 50% gross margin, uh, but it, it differs on locations. We have a less of a gross margin than on library, where we take a higher gross margin. But on the average, it's about a 50. It can be approximately 20% more than what we would normally charge for a license, uh, but all, it could go up to 70%. We do treat it like the negotiation of a rights-managed license, basically. We try to really figure out what the needs are and qualify it, and then quote price. Yeah. All right, any more questions? Are we all done? Yeah, I mean, Mike, I think the just final statement is, we, uh, I would say that custom content is a model that has been here forever. We all know it. We've, in our agencies, we've always offered a custom solution, so it's not something that is completely novel or new. The only thing that's different, I think, is that there are a few platforms that can use technology to facilitate the brief and prolificate that amongst a large group of creators who are willing to go do that. So it's, um, it, there is, it does take a special combination of certain things. One of them is technology, but the other one is a network willing to do it at a price that the brand is willing to pay. You know, the age old problem for all of us. So that is a snapshot in custom. <laughs>